Well, welcome everyone to the CMAX webinar to highlight the April 2022 SireProof results. My name is Jay Shannon. Uh, I'm Vice President of Marketing and Solutions at CMAX, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by three knowledgeable and passionate members of our product development team at CMAX. Uh, for jerseys, we have Jonathan Merriam, our Jersey Program Manager, who resides in, in California. For Holsteins, we have uh, Paul Trapp from Wisconsin, who leads our external product development team, and Mike West from Ontario, who plays an important role combining both external product development and product support for CMEX. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to be here, Jack. So if you're not familiar with Zoom, you will notice uh, uh, at the bottom of your screen or, or by moving your mouse to the bottom of the screen, uh, a Q&A item where you can click on it. It will come up and you can click on that and it will open a, a window like the one you see on the screen um, where you can enter any questions you have. And we encourage you that if you have a question at any point through the webinar that you, you entered in your Q&A, um, what we will do is um, I will be reviewing them as the, the session goes along and uh, we will try to address all questions before the end of the webinar. So um, I'm going, I need to start with, a, with um, a situation that we became aware of yesterday. And, um, and that is that uh, in the situation that occurred uh, on the U in the US uh, Holstein proof system, is an outdated female file uh, type file was was inadvertently sent by by Holstein USA to to CDCB, and that was used in the the genetic and genomic evaluation and and these females uh, because it's outdated there's some females that would have been added since um, that were not included in that side um, matching up with the rest of the information um, females are used in in SNP estimations for bulls. Uh, in the United States, and so the impacts kind of tear out quite a bit uh, in terms of the the proof, the proofs, and what happened. So the so they did a, a review of a, of the parts, reran some of the systems to try to understand the magnitude of the change, and and there was industry meetings held in the United States yesterday, and and they decided that um, they needed to rerun the U.S. proofs for Holstein. So this doesn't affect any other breed but Holstein rerun the, the, the Holstein proofs, proofs and reissue them. Um, and they're, and you, to make you appreciate the timing, uh, rerunning the proofs is not hours, it's days. So the decision was made that reissue of proofs would be next Tuesday, April 12th. Um, at our typical time, we would receive our, our, weekly, our weekly proofs. So we're gonna get updated type proofs on bulls, uh, TPIs, net merit, we know the feed saved will change because it, ha it has a body weight composite component in it. So there's going to be uh, tiers of change that will go in the proofs. Many of the tra traits won't be rerun, but they would be the same, but the overall impacts carry through from the type side. Um, magnitude of change, we're not 100% sure exactly, but um, we've had some indications from re the researchers in the from CDCB and sides that they that the net merit change might be in the magnitude of plus minus $20, so 20 um, in terms of how much a, a bull might change in the TPI side, maybe plus minus 50, but we really won't know that for sure till we see, till we see next week. And I think what that tells us is the proofs we have are quite, you know, that what we're talking about is a little small change that's going to occur that might shuffle a little on bull rankings, but for the most part, uh, the what we what we've been using and seeing all week has been has been a fair representation and there'll be a little bit of adjustment next week uh, because it's females also impacted here they were the core of the of the issue so updated female values um, and for people that use our outstanding elevate service you'll receive um, the updated values just like another monthly just like a new proof for these um, next Tuesday on females as well. So um, outside of, of that change that obviously 
all of our industry is dealing with and, and, and things do happen sometimes and those things, you know, and I think it's good to see an industry that's prepared to, to get it right and, and to um, make the adjustments and, and it affects everybody, but I think it's a good sign. Um, the proof highlights as far as what, would, what is, we knew was coming and what changes within. It's not a big proof uh, change as far as new traits. There's not really any new traits or, or any fundamental thing in the system that was changing. So we ne weren't necessarily expecting a lot of change through this, through this proof run outside of adding daughters. Um, in Canada, they adjust, we adjust the base every year. So every year in April, and then just for those that aren't aware in the United States, they, they adjust the base every five years. So, um, so the US takes that and, and what the base change is, is your genetic improvement, your genetic progress. So if you adjust it every year, then you're comparing to what is the population each year and it moves each year. And then in, uh, in the United States, they keep that fixed for five years and then move it all in one swoop of five years of genetic progress. So that's, that's gonna go and I'm gonna talk a little on that. In Canada, we, um, the one change that did happen in the system up till now, feed efficiency, so that the, the new trait that was released just last year is um, they decided to add uh, second lactation feed efficiency. So up till now, it was just a first lactation feed efficiency. Um, they've, they've done the research. It's not the same trait. It's actually quite a bit lower correlation than you could imagine between first and second lactation. So, so the, they combine the two, the two, uh, as, two as a multiple trait first and second lactation feed efficiency and put it into one evaluation for overall feed efficiency, which is what we're looking for. Adds a lot of reliability and, and daughters in the process. In the United States, um, you know, there was small changes uh, across, I'm just highlighting some of them. Um, they added 1 million milk only records. And, and so in some cases, people, herds are on DHI with milk only observations and they don't get the components. Uh, maybe it's partial um, milk on some, some tests. Uh, so rather than, and so they're adding these as more daughter and adding more accuracy of daughter information that's in. Uh, the uh, additional part is when animals are in the genomic genetic evaluation, then along comes their other traits if they have them. So by adding those million, anim, million milk records, you also potentially add health and fertility and other, other components on those animals. So it generally is a, is a good help to the US system. Um, ET fertility, um, so fertility records that really come from predominant ET herds uh, have been excluded to try to improve the overall, um, let's say apples and apples of, of the the DPR and, and heifer conception rate and cow conception rate evaluations in the US. Um, and then the final one is a type composite and net merit. It only affects the non-Holstein breeds. Um, and so what they've done is it's the part that is affecting is body weight composite that goes in net merit and cheese merit that has been aligned to the breed formula for that versus, versus I'm not sure what they had before, but um, so the, what we see is cheese merit, for example, in Jersey is coming a little closer to the JPI um, by that, just by that underlying effect in there. One of the things I'm gonna talk about a proof highlight for, for, for CMEX and is what we see is stability and diversity in our product lineup. And, and the stability is not because of, there's, well, there's little change and there's not a lot of change built in the system. Uh, some of our competitors actually dealt this proof with a fair bit of change that changed some bulls that have that are fairly important to them in the in the bloodlines that are there, and so they have. But what we saw in CMAX is a fair bit of stability from from this proof, to, from last proof to this proof, and even the one before that. And um, and there's reasons for it, and that's what we're going to talk about is some of those advantages uh, we have that we've that we've built to try to manage more stability and diversity in CMEX. And finally, I mean, if we think about a proof highlight here, uh, we have to talk about the Jersey dominance and we've seen it coming. We've seen ourselves and what we knew the, the strength was of our young animals and young bulls. Um, and, and this is a proof where, where we really got to see that, wow, we're really in a spot on the Jersey, on the Jersey breed and, um, and certainly 
you know, recognized uh, globally for being so strong there. And we're going to cover that a little and hand it off to Jonathan for more detail. But on the Canadian base change that happened in April 2022, um, milk, you can see. And so milk went up 105 kilograms, fat and protein, five and a half kilograms, four and a half kilograms. And you can see your type upwards to from between 0.5 to almost one point on the type side. And then your, your health and fertility traits somewhere around that 0.6 level in terms of, and, and, and if you want to think about what that base change, and I'm describing the Holstein column, obviously, but if you want to think about that base change, then a bull that was uh, 11 for mammary system, um, then in April, unless they're going to go up against the base, they're going to become a 10 bull. And so that's what you're going to see across. And if you imagine this kind of genetic progress that changes all the time, then then what we speak of as being a plus 10 bull to, you know, five years ago is not a plus 10 bull today because the progress that is underneath all the things in terms of uh, genetic advancement in the, the overall breed. Um, you will see LPI is zero. So that looks kind of strange, but what happens is they adjust the, the, they change the constant in the LPI formula so that the LPI scale changes, never changes and stays in, in relative across. So people can get used to the fact um, what 3,500 means or, or whatever. So that's what they try to do with the LPI. And if they didn't do it, the LPI would tend to keep inflating um, over. So that's an adjustment that's made in the LPI formula. Um, the Jersey and Ayrshire breeds uh, with lower reliabilities, sometimes lower heritabilities um, and overall opportunity in terms of genetic advancement that can happen year to year um, you see the, you know, you see the gains that happen generally in scale to the Holsteins in terms of the, the opportunity of a genetic advancement, but they also change their base each year. Just a little bit on Holsteins because it's an interesting time to just look when you see the base, what does it mean? I just throw the standard deviation up on these traits and then show the percentage of the base change versus standard deviation just to give us a, a bit of a measure of where's the, the breed advancing the most. And you can see the top trait is protein, um, where it's 21% of, of, a, of a standard deviation unit in one year. Um, and then you can see the second highest is fat and the third highest is mammary system. All of them over 10% of a, of a standard deviation amongst these traits. And obviously we could do that for all traits, but, but it's an interesting part to see the, the change of the breed happening by what's happening on the base each year. When we, when we said about CMAX equals stability and diversity and, and, and one part we just want us to cover is really, it's not by luck, it's by design. In many ways, it's what we do and how we're doing it that is aimed and, and putting a little more um, um, stability in our product line. And one of them is, uh, diversity of clients requires diversity of products. So there might be, you know, there might be some companies in the industry where their clients are a little more one kind of type looking for a certain kind of product line. And so they're building a product line that fits fairly much one, you know, one typical uh, client need. Uh, and then they become very, very channeled to that, to that product line. And and by the nature of CMEX, we aim at many products from many different markets. Um, by our origin of where we are in Canada to, to certain parts in terms of type, to the United States commercial markets, other things we, we really aim for. We're aiming for high net merit and TPI, high LPI. We have high type. We're doing health and immunity and really trying to develop that line. We have a lot of strong international indexes in Europe and other places to which we gauge and try to select product for. Uh, pole genetics, grazing, I mean, you name it. And, and the neat thing is every one of those products, there's a typical bloodlines that might be stronger in that product line. And that's, uh, and so that by nature creates a degree of diversity. You know, it's kind of funny talking diversity when you, when breeders are, are quite concerned where, where the diversity is going in the breed. And certainly what I'm just saying is these gives us opportunities that it won't be one bull, it won't be one bloodline, it won't be one sire of sun for us. It will be many sires of suns that, that will serve us, that, uh, that push a certain degree of diversity for us. The second part that, uh, that when we talk about 
um, you know, if I want to talk about diversity and stability, um, is expanding our options for sires of sons. And within our industry, CMEX is one of the few companies that have sought semen share arrangements of sires of sons for product for future product development. We have um, so when you when you think of that, there's some companies that have done virtually no sharing of, of semen from another company. Um, and so their product line becomes, they're somewhat vested in the fact that that's their, that's their genetic lines. And if there's impacts that, that make them go up or down, they will, their, their product line will go with it in almost a unison. And so um, by having maybe more cross of options, genetics that may be crossed into other, other studs and having some parts where we can complement that with genetics we've done, we create a degree of more diversity and stability within our group. So we're not just, just down one line. So we really think by the design of what we're doing and how we operate at CMEX, we basically are expanding our portfolio of genetics. We're reducing our risk. We're making us less vulnerable to proof change. And you know, some people would say, well, genomics and proof change, it wasn't supposed to happen. And what I think we see is genomics is just as vulnerable to proof change. Um, what you have is, if, if, if anything, you have changes that happen when daughters come that, and the change that happens changes SNP effects and changes the whole genetic genomics that fall through uh, there. So, so in many ways, genomics is still a about a lot of risk management. I mean, I believe strongly in genomics, but there's a risk management in terms of, of the amount of change that can be underlying. And the final one before I hand off to the, to the experts is, um, is uh, I think we can be, we can be uh, without being too overly bold, we have the number one Jersey program in the world and you don't have to look too far. Um, seven of the top 10 JPI sires in the US, seven of the 10 top 10 GPA LPI sires in Canada. Uh, just shows in those two, you know, in, in what is oftentimes not two indexes that correlate that well, uh, per se, between uh, uh, the US JPI or Cheese Merit and, and uh, the Canadian proofs, but to dominate on both sides uh, is just a strength of the program. Uh, and, it, and, and again, I, I think similar to the other, it's not by luck, uh, vision and strategy, understanding and really deciding of where we wanted to go with the Jersey program, uh, outstanding partners. So Vieira Dairy, uh, River Valley, two of the prominent Jersey farms in, 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 in the United States, North American breeders throughout both, both in Canada and US and, and working with the right people, uh, I think is all part of where we are. And, and so, and then being really aggressive, a lot of hard work and a little luck. And if you don't have luck, you'll never be successful. So luck is something you have to, to have and, and, and hope for. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan to take us through the Jersey results. Jonathan. Great, well, thank you. Uh, as Jay mentioned, a real exciting week uh, for Jersey's at CMEX. Uh, just uh, this slide kind of shows some highlights. Uh, Jay mentioned the number that we had in the, the top 10. Uh, Ford Jersey's uh, chief is uh, the number one JPI sire. Uh, he's also happens to be uh, the number one LPI mace sire in Canada. So just uh, having a tremendous impact uh, globally uh, from chief. Uh, number two on the JPI list is the boss, uh, young bull that's been uh, talked about quite a bit lately, uh, going through the Amplify Sale Syndicate. Uh, and then number three is a, a chief son margin. Uh, as mentioned, four of the top five JPI sires from the historic uh, US Jersey list uh, are at CMEX, seven of the top 10. And then as we go over to the LPI list in Canada, uh, number one, uh, genomic LPI bull is Devour with to be famous and honeydew numbers two and three on the genomic lpi list with overall seven of the top 10. Uh, just a tremendous week uh, obviously chief has had a huge impact on that as you look at most of those pedigrees in the top 10 uh, they are chief uh, sons and our grandsons but there is a little diversity there as well but chief is just making a tremendous impact and so obviously, as, as we move on to the highlights of the Proven Bulls, uh, Chief is uh, one that's most uh, talked about. Uh, 
mentioned his ranking for JPI uh, uh, cheese merit dollars. He's also uh, number one uh, at 187 JPI and 899 cheese merit, uh, 2100 of milk, 145 of CFP, and his Canadian numbers at 2373 LPI and over 3600 pro dollar. Another highlight uh, from our proven lineup is Lute, uh, 200J 1138. Uh, he doubled his number of daughters in his production proof and came up across the board at over 1,000 of milk, 92 of fat, and 66 of protein, which ranks him the top five among pro proven bulls for fat and number two in the breed for protein, uh, two extremely important uh, characteristics for the Jersey breed. Uh, so just a real uh, strong day uh, for Proven Bulls, uh, for CMEX, maybe not uh, a lot of numbers, but a lot of strength, uh, particularly in these two bulls. Uh, as we move on to the influence that uh, Chief uh, will have, continue to have in our uh, program, uh, just a highlight in uh, some of his uh, sons, uh, the top five. Average 156 JPI, 731 a cheese merit, and 2082 on, on the LPI list. As Jay mentioned, uh, it's not always uh, common to see uh, strength on both lists, uh, particularly in the same genetics, but Chief is doing that. Uh, some highlights. Uh, um, margin is a Chief Sun at 180 JPI and 884 cheese merit. Devour, uh, the current number one genomic LPI, uh, Sire at 2225 for LPI and 3153 on Pro Dollar. And then Courage is an up and coming one, just about to be collected, a chief son uh, who you'll notice will actually take over that top spot on the LPI list uh, when he's of age at 2287 and almost 23 of JUI. So uh, you can see Chief is not only siring the production kind, but also he can put the, uh, the functional type in there as well. Uh, we also have a lot of influence uh, from Chief through his grandsons. Uh, the boss, as mentioned uh, before, is a highlight, uh, number two JPI at 182, uh, almost 900 at cheese merit, uh, just a tremendous uh, production bull. Uh, then we've also got a grandson, Mayer, uh, just starting to be collected at 165 JPI and 776 cheese merit. And Monarch, who's be being released as an ERS sire, uh, as a Sinatra out of a chief at 157 JPI, 695 cheese merit, and 1.3 DPR. So within the uh, chief genetics, again, there's that production that uh, we commonly see, but we're also seeing strength in udders and in some of the health traits as well. So there's quite a bit of diversity uh, through his offspring and or his sons as well as his grandsons. Uh, CMEX, we also have uh, access to some of his uh, top daughters. Uh, the three cows pictured on the left are chief daughters at the alum herd in California. And the cow on the left uh, is the souvenir cow that uh, Alums did a fair bit of ET work as a heifer. They continue to now as a cow. Uh, her first three sons uh, that have come through uh, are uh, ranged from 157 to 185 JPI. She has two 10 penny sons that will be coming to CMEX. Uh, so she's transmitting those uh, popular chief genetics. Uh, a few other highlights from our uh, CMEX program through the daughters, uh, the Jersey Gold. Uh, Squaw Heifer is uh, a recent acquisition. Uh, she is the number one jersey for cheese merit at 915 and 180 JPI. Uh, Viera Lamb is a chief daughter that's over 100 pounds of fat and 165 CFP. And then Willow, another strong production uh, heifer with almost 150 CFP, all strong in JPI and, and cheese merit. So just tremendous uh, females to be working with in the program to uh, produce the next generation of, of bulls. We've talked a lot about Chief. 
And uh, so uh, we've got to make sure that we have some diversity. But uh, Jay mentioned earlier that we do work on that. And we've continued to do that, uh, to have those uh, genetic lines that are a little different than chief. And we continue to have a strong lineup outside of the chief bloodlines. Uh, our headliner for that would be the ZZ Top Bull that's just uh, being released as ERS. Uh, Clapton Sun at 169 JPI and over 860 cheese merit. Another tremendous production bull. Uh, the Ludicrous Bull will soon be collected. He's a gallantry out of a Skyler. And the Aussie Bull has just been released and Elvis Sun uh, at over 120 CFP and 730 cheese merit. So tremendous offerings outside of the chief bloodlines as well. So continue to be able to build the uh, CMEX jersey program. Uh, next slide talks about the highlights uh, just in cheese merit dollars. Uh, CMEX has continued to emphasize the importance of cheese merit, do merit dollars as well as uh, JPI. And so there's a, a definite uh, emphasis as we make matings and select animals for the next generation. And this shows the success of that uh, program. Uh, you've seen many of uh, these bulls already in previous slides, such as the boss and and margin and ZZ Top, uh, but a few uh, new ones kind of coming through the pipeline, uh, resulting from a, a very successful flush at the Ellen Farms Partnership herd, uh, spiral to a, a homozygous polled Listowel, uh, produced uh, three sons that are all in the uh, program, uh, one over 800 to cheese merit, and the other two both uh, over 700, uh, well over 700 uh, cheese merit. Also high production bulls, a uh, good solid uh, type and good reproductive uh, uh, breakdowns. And so just uh, tremendous uh, cheese merit animals coming in the, uh, in the program. And as mentioned there, six of the top 10 cheese merit bulls are uh, at CMEX and 15 of the top 50. So just a tremendous opportunity there. Uh, yes, Chief has a, a pretty strong presence in those pedigrees, but there are some uh, out across to Chief, and so we've got that diversity that will continue to meet the demands uh, of the Jersey breed. Uh, as Jay had mentioned, we uh, also very strong on the genomic uh, or the LPI uh, list in Canada with seven of the top 10 uh, genomic LPI sires and six of the top 10 genomic pro dollar bulls. Uh, the highlights again strength of Chief, but uh, Devour, To Be Famous, Honeydew, Margin, Circle the Boss, and Drop Teen, uh, just a tremendous group of bulls uh, to be highlighted uh, across North America, whether you're looking at the U.S. system or the Canadian system. Uh, a lot of production, good functional type, and uh, good health traits with good uh, fertility traits as well. So a lot of diversity in those characteristics to choose from and continue to uh, improve the Jersey breed. And a uh, highlight of uh, the CMEX program is the Immunity Plus. And this round was a real exciting uh, round for jerseys. We've had some good solid jerseys that are Immunity Plus, uh, but this round uh, highlighted some of our uh, more elite bulls that are also Immunity Plus. Uh, Monarch uh, was mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, and excitement there when he came through as a immunity plus sire, uh, 157 JPI, almost 700 at cheese merit and over 2000 on genomic LPI. Uh, so just a very elite bull on all systems and to have that immunity plus added on as a real benefit. Uh, Clapton is a uh, immunity plus bull that was already identified. He actually came up in this production round, which actually influence some of his uh, offspring as well. So a, a real positive there. And then the next three are on the list are all new uh, just for these evaluations as identified as immunity plus at uh, 139 to 154 JPI, all over 600 cheese merit. Uh, just tremendous additions to the Jersey uh, lineup to also be immunity plus. And so to add that, uh, uh, benefit of the health uh, aspects to the lineup. Uh, just a tremendous week for the Jersey uh, lineup at CMEX. Uh, 
a lot of strength in, uh, in and diversity in their production and fertility and health traits. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, a bit of a tough act for Paul and I to follow and talk about some Holstein. So I think Paul and Jersey's had such a great, uh, great, great week. And uh, I think really echoes the comments about how we really tried to grow that program and the, the fruits of those labors have come through to so congratulations to everybody involved in our jersey program but we've got some great highlights i think paul to talk about on the holstein end of things as well um, and you see this first slide where we talk about that global strength and local impact you know as jay talked about earlier about planning and putting the work in and having a bit of luck to go with it i think as we look at what we try to do in the holstein line we, we try to develop those bloodlines through diversity um, and have those strong, reliable proofs, but we try to use our di diversity in different bloodlines and a, a, an intense selection pattern, Paul, to try and to, to get those bulls that are gonna do well in, in these numbers you see in Canada and the US, but also those high rankings in Italy and UK that you hear us talk about at each one of these proof round webinars of the success that we've seen globally. And, and it's not always the same bulls in every country. Sometimes it's, you, you see some common names, but sometimes you see those different ones come through. And that's, that's what makes CMEX that global company and being able to impact uh, globally at, to, to everybody in their local proofs and on have that local impact that we talk about when you look at bulls like uh, Perseus and Penchant, the, the two Pursuit brothers in, in Italy, and then the bulls like Yamaska and Attico and Raptors that, that rank high on those different indexes in UK, plus some of these other bulls in the US and Canada that we'll talk about more in, uh, extensively here in some upcoming slides. But Jay, if you just go to the next slide and we and we move along here and, and get talking about some some of the uh, the local success that we had in, in the LPI proven round this time is, is West Coast Alcove came through again for the third consecutive uh, proof round at the number one LPI spot at 3829 LPI. I'm, I'm pretty excited to see this bull hang in there strong and and do what he's doing. Alcove's a bull that's influencing the company, not just through his own sales and what he's, how he's impacting our breeders through his own semen, but we see his influence through his sons. Uh, we also see his influence from a maternal grandsire now coming through in pedigrees as well. So the dominance of Alcove, not only as number one, uh, like I said, for the third consecutive time uh, is extensive and, and touches on a lot of different points. He's 223 points above the number two LPI sire Paul in the rankings and it's it's pretty dominant to see him there uh, in that that position just go back one slide please Jay and Alcove still comes through at the, the number two pro dollars position as well he's sired by Duke out of an MVP epic Ramos Shottle Morty some great bulls back in the the pedigree from Golden Oaks uh, with 2300 kilograms of milk and 147 kilos of fat and 98 kilos of protein and with big pluses on his fat and protein deviation combined with great dairy strength numbers of plus 15. And if we go on to the next slide and look at some of these daughters that he has, you see those great traits coming through from what we see in his linear breakdown. We see them coming through in a very, very consistent breeding pattern uh, from Alcove and what we see in, the, in his daughters in the field. Just starting to calve now for the second time. So we're anxiously anticipating to see the results of that, but we're, we're really happy with what we've seen as, they develop, have, as they've developed through that first lactation. Alcove's a bull that adds strength. Every one of his daughters, you're going to see width and depth and, and that substance and, and strength that we, we want to add back into the breed, but at the same time, not sacrificing anything in that quality of mammary system. And these are not only good, good functional, well-attached udders, but as you see at 2,300 kilos of milk, they do milk extremely, extremely well. And uh, we can expect that to, to continue with Alcove and that's what's keeping them so high in the rankings, that great balance of production and components and and solid type figures. But Alcove's not the only bull that we've got in our, in our top LPI rankings. Uh, we've got uh, some great names that continue to stick around and be very, very reliable. Uh, when we talk about strength and stability that Jay talked about in those earlier slides, we've, we've got some names here, Paul, on, on some bulls that have been around for, for just more than one proof round. They're not just one-shot wonders, they, they, they stay in there. And they've been very successful for a lot of people, a lot of breeders around the world, and a lot of our salespeople around the world have uh, been great, uh, great weapons in their arsenal to, to be able to, to go to the field and sell to the customer. When we look at bulls like uh, the Boldy V Gymnast Bull, the Doors Open Sun with almost 2,000 kilos of milk. He's a bull that does great, a great job on teat placement. He's a positive daughter fertility bull, just a bull that's really continued to climb and, 
and, and, and stay in the top rankings and solidify himself in a solid spot on the LPI list. Alligator, it's a bull that doesn't need a lot of introduction. He's, for me, I think he's probably one of the most popular proven bulls in the industry today. Um, what can you, there's so much to be said about Alligator, whether it's his high type you talk about, his exceptional production that we see from his daughters, the way they've developed from their second to their third lactation. I mean, you see that cow pictured in the bottom left corner of the collage there, the, his first excellent daughter. He, he's an exceptional bull in, in every right. Uh, he, he just touches on so many, so many ways. We've seen a success with his young heifers as well in the, uh, in the heifer rings with junior champion at the Holstein show last November. I mean, the bull does it all. So what there's, there's so many great things to be said about him solidifying himself still in that top rankings of LPI. And then Mr. Consistency for me is, is the Malari fuel bull. I mean, the bull just keeps hanging in there and keep, keeps doing it. This is a bull that's, I think as consistent as any bull in our breed today with his, with his big production yields and component yields, he's a bull that's going to add that, uh, that strength, that power, that quality again, in, in, in their foot, foot and leg structure. And he's a bull that's going to add longevity because of that production and performance and uh, just that total package that he puts together, but a great group of proven LPI bulls, I think, Paul, but another segment that I wanted to touch on is, is the confirmation segment. And, you know, this bull's been around, we, we've talked about him for a long time as the Walnut Long sidekick bull. Um, doesn't need a lot of introduction again. We've saw his great success right from the, the day his first calves started hitting the ground. I think we were getting calls about how great the calves were, how thrifty and how uh, aggressive the calves were and now we see them in their second lactation paul and i think we're seeing great results all around the world uh this abbott from mccutcheon summer one of the most famous cows in our breed today lavengard sioux this is a bull that does a great job on the mammary system and when you see that picture of the group of uh of progeny at belfast holsteins in quebec this is what he's doing best is, is that mammary system and when they calve that second time it's uh it's pretty exceptional what we're seeing Hard tops, great width, great strength. For a confirmation to be number one at plus 16, I think sidekick, no doubt, has solidified himself as, as one of the breed's best type bulls of his time. And uh, we'll continue to do, do so. And I can't wait to see what we see uh, in the upcoming months, especially in the fall when uh, we get a couple of those big fall shows coming around. I think there'll be some guys that'll have some fun judging some of those cows. But some other proven confirmation bulls uh, that I think, Paul, we should touch on, and I'll be interested to hear your comments as well, but is, is bulls like Crushable that still sticking around, and I think we're hearing a lot of good things. I know you'll have some, some input on him, uh, but time and time again, we're getting calls about the Crushables. He's seeing and hearing about another good one in this barn or that barn or at this show. When you, when you get a bull with memory system scores and foot and leg scores like Crushable, there's no doubt he's going to stick around and have great results. But a bull that's really standing out to me and really uh, needs a second look is clean up deal maker a unix son that just seems to get better and better his numbers just just keep improving now comes in at plus 13 on confirmation with a solid proof all the way through we're now seeing daughters of his in his third lactation and i think this bull is just starting to get some notice by some guys that they need to, to pay attention to him and try and produce daughters like this cow we see in the picture in the early deal maker misty a tremendous quality uh, exceptional mammary systems, just cows that get better and better with age. And then when you throw in a bull like the Victor bull, the legend maker Victor, backed by that great pedigree, back to Chief Adin, a bull again that remains solid and consistent, a bull that we can count on is very reliable. We see that high reliability in his proof. And we've seen the results. We've seen results like the Lola cow and the, her success in the show ring, a cow that's fresh and supposed to look fantastic. I think a bull that's really really made a mark for himself. And these three bulls, I think Paul are, are really paving the way for, for great confirmation results. And I know you're seeing, seeing things at some of the shows you've attended recently this year. Uh, would love to hear your comments about these bulls as well as some of the others you're gonna talk about. Yeah, certainly Mike, uh, your comments here. And uh, as we get towards spring and really it kind of, you know, most people been almost in hibernation due to COVID the last couple of years. So the excitement with spring for breeders and farmers comes with not only planting their uh, crops, but also with getting out, seeing breeders and going to shows. And we're seeing, seeing that in the, some of the early sales that have been there, the market's been strong for show cattle. The interest is certainly up and people are attending them well. Um, I traveled in New York uh, 
recently and uh bull that we weren't necessarily looking for the daughters but we stumbled on a lot of crushables just consistent cows straight line youthful udders very balanced in their frame and uh, for me i think he's going to make cows that age really well he's going to make a lot of excellent cows when it's all said and done he makes happy customers and many of those astute uh, type breeders are going back to use him because they like what they're seeing in the milking daughters and i'd be remiss if I didn't put in a nice plug for a sidekick, uh, he I'm uh, was at the Southern National Junior Show yesterday in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and uh, he did win two classes: the winter yearling class and the senior yearling class. And uh, the senior yearling went on to be reserve junior champion, and I can honestly say that made two young men very happy with those winners, of the, as they happen to be my son. So uh, <laughs> sidekick carries a nice, uh, good spot in my heart. Uh, Jay, if we go on to the next slide, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about one of my other favorite bulls, kind of a different genre, is the uh, Pine Tree Pursuit Bull. Uh, when we get the official information next Tuesday, as Jay talked about, you're still going to be able to find Pursuit ranking at the top end of the proven bulls. This bull currently over 2,900 uh, TPI, had a nice day, uh, average added over seven, uh, 104, 74 milking daughters and 54 scored. Uh, Jay, as we go to the next slide, the proof is really in the pudding. When you talk to breeders uh, from coast to coast in smaller farms, large farms, I talked to a breeder in New Mexico that's milking 20,000 cows and just loves his pursuits. This is a bull that went up in production. Uh, he's over 1,600 pounds of milk, and he's a plus for fat and protein percent. So you get the volume of milk, but you also get the nice percents and uh, that total combined fat and protein to go with it. When you talk to dairymen, they really like these daughters. They're honest, hardworking dairy cows, and he's doing a lot of things right that people are looking for. He's adding some slope to the rump. He adds a little set to the leg, and he's actually positive for teat length. So those are three things from a linear pattern you hear from a lot of breeders that Mike and our team, we talk to, and that's uh, a proven bull that does it day in, day out. And much like some of the Canadian bulls you talked about, there are some other bulls of ours that rank well on the uh, TPI list. You talked about Alcove. We know who he is. Um, another bull with great production levels and great components and a high level of combined fat and protein right at 179 on the U.S. figures. This bull added almost 400 score daughters this time, so he's over 900 scored. He's over a point on type and 136 on his utter composite. Net net that gave him a gain of over 60 TPI points this time and almost 40 net merit points. Another favorite as you talk to people is the Sandy Valley Challenger Bull. This bull comes from the Larcrest cow family and this is a global cow family that's done very well. And Challenger comes to us and does what the cow family does as well. Makes youthful udders and these are healthy cows. He's really good for DPR at 1.3. He's really outstanding for fat tests and plus on protein and does lower the cell count. And the nice thing about saying, uh, Challenger is these cows are going to age well. They're more of a medium sized type of cow um, and makes happy customers. Uh, the West Coast Yaxima, uh, Yaxima bull is the number one bull in the UK, as Mike mentioned earlier. But this bull also did a nice job on GP, GTPI by gaining almost 50 points this time and over 25 points for net merit. These are uh, balanced frame cows with great, tremendous rear udders. He will straighten the rear leg, but he is over a point and a half on type. And he has a different pedigree. He's a, being an afterburner out of a Yoder, out of a Freddy. Next, Jay, we'll talk a little bit about um, some high GTPI and net merit genomic bulls that are being released to the market. Mike, this... Uh, this list of bulls is no stranger to us. The product development team has anticipated this group of bulls, and we've worked hard to use these bulls in our ERS herds and matings, and we'll see a lot of calves born from this group of bulls in the next three, six, nine months. This is kind of the who's who of our mating sires from the last, uh, last year or so. Holy Smokes, a bull that was one of the top genomic bulls of his age group. Uh, he was on our Many uh, social media says a young calf is one of the highest bulls in the breed and continues to rank as one of the highest bulls in the breed for his age group. He's got a very balanced profile to him with TPI and overall type and milk, and he's backed by the great Mano Man Halo cow family. Overdue is another bull that was well anticipated and continues to be very popular. The bull uh, stems from the Ladies Manor cow family. <coughs> his dam is a granite. 
that has really put Ladies Manor almost back on the genomic map. She's had a great track record in making offspring and continues to do well. Simmer's Brave is another bull that's been extremely popular. <coughs> Excuse me, and he tickles right at almost 3,000 on his GTPI level, but this bull is a huge production bull at over 2,100 pounds of milk, and yet with those beautiful udders at a 1.4 on his udder composite. As we go to the next slide, <coughs> excuse me, I just wanted to mention uh, Seamer's party there, Jay. He's a twitch son out of an excellent Delta Lambda. It's over 1,200 pounds of milk. That's over pushing two and a half on type and over 2.3 on our composite. This is a cow family that's done very well uh, throughout the industry and a cow family developed at Seamer's Holstein's. Next slide, uh, a lot of your dairymen and customers like to get volumes of milk. So we looked at a group of bulls that over high level of milk, but yet they want those milks to come out of pretty udders. So these are all a group of bulls of 10 bulls that are high volume of milk that average right at 1650 for milk. And they're all over a point on a point and a half on udder composites. Some of the bulls noted on this list include uh, the fast start star bull Seamer's Porsche, who's almost 1.75 on type, but a beautiful linear pattern. And he is from the same cow family, as I mentioned, the Seamers uh, party bull. And his maternal grandsire is a granite, and granite was a bull that was really loved throughout our industry, and particularly at Seamers Holsteins. Fellowship is a bull from our internal program, who is a high jump out of Amarius uh, that we've used quite heavily and has some nice offspring coming. That's over two points on type and pushing two and a half on his outer composite. Another bull developed at uh, Cookie Cutter Holsteins is the Horseshoe Bull. This is a high jump out of a Verona, out of a Rubicom, out of a JC back to Man Man Halo. Again, same cow family to produce holy smokes. This is a bull that's got a really nice linear pattern, comes out right at 1.8 on its overall type. As we look at uh, the next slide, Jay, we're going to talk a little bit about some overall balance sires. Uh, some of these bulls, Fellowship Party, were all, we talked about already. Some of the other ones, uh, I just want to mention Seamers Hanley, who is a challenger son, and his also uh, his dam was raised recently to excellent 91. The next dam back is 91, then a 94 mogul hanker, who has about 15% of the herd at Seamers Holstein. Go back to that cow, and she's under out of none other than Man O' Man Halo herself. So this is a great cow family again, and then over two points in type and two and a half on his utter composite. The drop box bull, a bull that's just getting released or getting available as a high jump son. His dam, you may recognize the great picture that Carl Saussier has put on uh, Facebook recently, a 91 Casper. That's a beautiful long dairy cow with an exceptional otter and a great foot and leg. Uh, that'll certainly be a higher scoring cow the more calves she has. She's backed by a 92 Delta, then a 93 Dorman, then a 94 cow, two more very goods, and then two more excellent. So great pedigree. This bull pushes right at three points on type and otter composite with a beautiful linear pattern. And we have a lot of people that are excited to use him. Also mentioned the cookie cutter Larson bull, who is another high jump son out of a Helix, and then a Delta and three excellent dams behind that. He's also over two points on type butter composite with a, basically a no holes linear pattern. So really defines the balance level of bulls in this group. Um, Mike, if you want to tell us a little bit about some of them that rank well on LPI in this category. Yeah, great comments, Paul. And I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great to see those groups that, that excel in the other the other segments that you talked about, but then to try and produce these, these balanced one to balanced bulls on both the TPI and LPI scale, I think we know that we've got customers around the world that want to have that balance of, of good udders, good feet and legs, good type, good milk that end up with, with solid indexes as well. And when we see the couple of bulls on here, uh, we see Alcove's influence coming through and in Lugnut and Mercy, both Alcove sons from Eugenio's with those kind of numbers, you see a pair of bulls in, in Lugnut and Mercy with, with the big production numbers of 1,800 and 1,700 kilos of milk respectively between the two bulls, pair of bulls that are both double digit for confirmation with solid mammary system scores. You know, this is what I think so many breeders are, are wanting to get is to, to get that solid linear breakdown with, with, solid, uh, with solid pedigrees behind it, but great yields and, and, the, and the confirmation that'll breed longevity and long lasting cows. 
Uh, you get a bull on there like the Jakers bull. And for, for, for me, Paul, this Jakers bull ticks a lot of boxes. I think Midas, Midas touch Jakers and alley -oop from a King doc from a bourbon. This is a bull that's extremely, extremely balanced. I think for me, he has a bit of everything with, with plus 10 on mammary system, plus 10 on feet and legs, over 1600 kilograms of milk. And really when you look at his health and fertility breakdown, no real holes in it as well easy either. So I think very, very complete bulls, whether you take any one of these eight as examples of what we have in our lineup, there's quite a few more I'm sure that we could talk about, but we, we didn't wanna take up too much of our time uh, just with this one segment alone, but I think a great example of what we try and do every day and the kind of bulls we're trying to produce for the next generations to come. But as we go into the next segment of, of A2A2, I think we all know that this is a growing segment and we, we continue to talk about it on these webinars. We continue to talk about it in, in our daily meetings, in our mating decisions. Paul, I think when we, when we sit down and our group's going to do our different matings throughout the week, we are paying more and more attention to, to A2A2 and trying to get that combination of from that maternal and paternal side and try and get as many A2A2 sires as, as we possibly can um, as we see that market segment growing. But we don't want to just get the brand. We don't just want to get A2A2. We want to see elite bulls at the top of the list carrying that as well. And when you can get a bull like the West Coast early bird that goes over 3000 for, for GTPI with great milk numbers, utter composite scores of, of just under two, all, just under a thousand net merit dollars. I mean, a very, very complete bull to go with A2A2 on top of that, sired by Einstein from a renegade with that great pedigree to go with it. He's just one of, of a group of these bulls that, uh, that is stellar in so many different traits. And a bull that you, you mentioned earlier, Paul, in one of your slides was the, the cookie cutter horseshoe bull. And I did some digging on, on different bulls this morning. And when you do your sorts and you look at bulls that are over a point, 1.8 on type, over a point and a half on udders, and over 1,450 pounds of milk, there's not very many bulls left at that top of the charts. And there you'll find horseshoe still amongst that segment. You throw A2A2 on top of that, he's one of a very, very small group of bulls that can tick all those boxes. I think he's a very, very complete bull that we've just added to our lineup. We've got a lot of great bulls in this, uh, this list. Another one that's very, very interesting is the, is the Ascend bull, Progenesis Ascend, at 1,082 net merit. A2A2, he ranks at the top of the charts for, for the net merit dollars, but he also has so many other great traits to go with it. And one of the standouts for me, Paul, on him is his calving ease. And I know everyone's changed in the way they look at calving ease a little bit since, uh, since they redid uh, did that number, but at 0.8% calving ease, he's a leader. He's leading the charge in the breed for, for easy calving for the commercial dairymans that really want to still pay a lot of attention to that. We've used him as a sire of sons, and I think the impact of Ascend and others of these in this, in this grouping are going to be seen for more generations to come. Uh, and carry that A2A2 A2 and, and build on that for our breeders around the world and, uh, and our consumers that, that, that want to pay attention to that. So just wanted to highlight a few of those bulls. And as we go into the next segment, it's a bull that I think we can both ha have some input here on, Paul, but I think we've got a great lineup of bulls coming from that type and pedigree uh, breeder segment uh, that we get talked about and get asked about around the world. Some of the bulls on this list that are, are available, some of them are going to be coming few of these bulls we get asked about on a daily basis. I think I've had three text messages come through since we've started this presentation on one of these guys and, and their semen will be there soon. But to start with some bulls that are available or about to be is the, is the group at the top, Cherry Hill Action Man, the alligator from an impression from an aftershock that goes back to the, the Chief of Dean Cow family, a really impressive bull in his own right. And he's got great type numbers to go with it. Just released on April 1st, our, our first alligator son to come to the market. See below him is the Mattenhoff Harris Bull will be released in 1st of May. Um, but this is a pretty impressive bull, a Lambda from a tattoo from an Atwood. That Atwood just was grand champion at, at a pretty special show at Expo Bull in, in Europe and is garnering a lot of attention. It's a cow that I wish would put on my bucket list to see at some point in my life and, and hope to do so. Followed by Talk Farm Ashton, maybe not quite as extreme on the confirmation number, Paul, but our colleague Angelo repeatedly tells us about what a great European cow family this is and one of the most respected cow families over there. So three great bulls that are coming to our are available in our market now, but I think you've got some special interest in some of these bulls that are coming soon. Um, what do you see in this list that stands out for you? 
Yeah, the one thing that stands out is the unique sires. You look at the pedigrees of these, you know, there's bulls all throughout that right side on the bulls that we have semen are coming on that. Uh, they come from cow families that are globally known, and it's sire stacks that make logical sense. You know, and they're not all CMEX sires, but they're bulls that are bred good, they're popular, um, and people like them. So we've gone out as a team and acquired these bulls, whether they're in Europe, whether they're in Canada, and whether they're in the U.S., and one of the bulls, this bullseye bull, uh, he was probably one of the more popular bulls to try and get last year in the U.S. And we were able to bring him uh, to CMEX and we're looking forward. He's right on the verge of making semen now, uh, but a Delta Lambda son, if anybody was at World Dairy Expo last year, uh, his mother uh, caught your eye. It was appropriately named and she did catch the judge's eye as she was the All-American and first place junior two-year-old at World Dairy Expo. And uh, she also caught the eye of being sold at Duckett's Holsteins for over 100,000 last year. The pedigree behind it is a household name backed by multiple generations of uh, uh, all Americans and nominated cows, goes all the way back to Speckle as the second dam, or the seventh dam was a two time all American. Uh, six dam Black Rose was a two time all American. And uh, the third dam, Goldwyn Lexington, uh, was a three time nominated, twice reserve, and was the all American five year old. In, uh, 2013. A bull that uh, he's going to be very popular US wise, he's over three on type and yet comes with 800 pounds of milk. Another bull that just arrived at the CMEX that we're excited to have and was approaching his first uh, year old birthday is the Have No Fear Bull. Uh, another Lambda son out of a King Doc was a very popular bull. Uh, his mother was nominated in 2019 in the milking yearling class the next dam is a very good jedi then a very good massey and then we find man oh man halo again so i've talked about about her name up a lot of ways so this is a stem of the cow family and just as a reminder for people listening halo goes right back to the one and only della herself so all that good reagan crest breeding uh now comes through this man oh man halo with the cookie cutter uh but you're back by all those generations are very good or excellent and uh have no fear is it going to be an exciting bull. Uh, his dam has a full sister that uh, unfortunately was sick at Madison last year, but probably would have had something to say about that Intermediate Champion Award, and she's been here before too long. Uh, I just note, too, on the Predator Bull, Mike, um, if people were paying attention on your uh, sidekick slide, you had the dam's picture there. So he's an alley-oop out of that sidekick, Pamela, and it's backed by uh, Todd Stanek's family, uh, that's got multiple generations of very good or excellent. And this bull stands right at four points on type. So we got some exciting things to come for our sales team um, and also a lot of exciting bulls that are available today. Yeah, that, that's great, Paul. I think uh, a great lineup of bulls with some great, uh, great names in there and uh, prefixes. I think that so many people recognize. Switch gears here a little bit. We wanted to touch base on Immunity Plus, uh, an anniversary for, for Immunity Plus this year. Immunity Plus has been around for 10 years, and let me remind you that Immunity, uh, Immunity Plus is exclusive to CMEX. This is a brand that's exclusive to us, but we've seen 10 years of proven results. We've been able to produce 10 years of healthier calves and cows for our breeders around the world, and 10 years of less, uh, less disease in our herds as a result of the, the great research that the University of Guelph and CMEX have done uh, to bring us this brand. So looking forward to seeing more and more great Immunity Plus sires come. And when we look at our lineup uh, of Immunity Plus sires, Paul, it's it's no slouch of a group of bulls. It's there's some there's some great elite level bulls in there that can do more than just make healthy cows. They can bring profitability. When you see that there's more than 49, 49 bulls over 2,800 TPI, 30 bulls over the 3,500 mark for GLPI. But one of the cool things about the Immunity Plus brand is the number of different sires that in pedigree that we're seeing represented in that top listing. And when you're able to see in our entire Immunity Plus lineup, 38 different sires represented it, 45 different maternal grandsires represented it. When we talk about diversity and stability, this is all the things that we're trying to do in our, in our product development and, our, and in the lineup of bulls that we produce is that diversity with great genetic levels to go with it. You see it extends as high as 1100 in net merit. We touch on A2A2 in there again with 44 bulls uh, with an A2A2 designation. Great utter scores as, a, as an entire group of over a 1.3 utter composite. And these aren't bulls that are extreme in stature. They're moderate stature. They're great for today's progressive dairymen at an average stature level of 0.6, just a very comfortable 
overall size the majority of these bulls that, that fit in this lineup. So a very unique group of bulls in the Immunity Plus. And when we, when we look at some examples in the next slide of the bulls that, that come through, and I'm not gonna go through each one of them in, in great detail. Some of these bulls we've talked about already in this presentation and, and in past ones, but when you look at the Immunity Plus group and, and the genetic level that our Immunity Plus brand is still able to achieve, you get bulls like OCD Mookie, that is the number one GTPI Immunity Plus bull in the world at 3,010. A very, very unique bull that we use quite a bit through our product development program for making that next generation. I think he's gonna be a very unique unique sire for, for years to come for our, for our customers. But then when you get also get a bull like Windstar Grey Cup, the number one net merit Immunity Plus bull at 1126, you know, a bull that, you know, with his calves just hitting the ground now from our product development or ERS usage and their numbers coming through extremely high, as high or higher than what we're seeing from, from Grey Cup. It's just two examples of what this brand and where it's going it continues to grow each and every proof round as we add new bulls to it. And there's some great bulls down this lineup when you talk about any of them, whether you want to talk about Poor, Shurzade or Prologue, you know, unique bulls with great genetic profiles and something very unique to offer everybody, but the one commonality is they're going to be healthier cows, uh, no matter which way you look about it. So Paul, I think we've had a great group of bulls to talk about from Holsteins to, to jerseys. It's been an exciting proof round. We'll get to relive it again next Tuesday, it sounds like, um, but I'll turn it back over here to, to Jay now uh, to, to wind up our, our, our webinar today. Thank you, Mike, and, and thank you, Paul, um, and thank you, Jonathan. The, I mean, so I love the passion and I, and I love the, the, the product and the diversity and the strength of product we have across. So, so great job and, and uh, really great to watch. Um, I would like to, before we go on to some questions and we just have a few, uh, I would like to announce. And so I do say that if you do have a question to put it into the, to the question box. Um, but before we go there is I would like to announce the next webinar that's scheduled for Thursday, May 19th uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time or Toronto time. Um, as you would know it, the, we are pleased to have a, with us for this webinar, a world leading expert in veterinary medicine um, from the University of Guelph, Dr. Stephen LeBlanc. Uh, he will be discussing um, whether it's possible uh, for your farms to, to achieve high production health and fertility together. And I think he's gonna tell us it can be, um, but there's always the, the, the push of doing so. So his, his talk is, is, is called the, the Triple Crown or the Bermuda Triangle in terms of achieving those three parts together. So, so I say, don't wait. I think it'll be really interesting and, and a great uh, webinar to be part of. Don't wait, go to cmex.com and, and enroll for this webinar um, today. So I'm gonna go on to, to questions. Um, so my, my first question, uh, this is for Mike and Paul is, what is the factor by which the alligator bull remains among the best in the world today? And what characteristics do you begin to see in his daughters? Well, a unique, uh, unique question, Jay and Paul. If you don't mind, I'll take it. But um, you know, when we look at Alligator, I mean, his his breakdown just fits that LPI formula so well with his with his good components, his solid type, his his very profitable production, and that's what's kept him up there in the listings for for so long. But what we're seeing come through in the field is is those exact traits. We're seeing cows that milk extremely well. They're dairy. They're wet looking. Uh, but we're also seeing them have the, the type traits for longevity, the feet and legs, the mammary system, the, the right amount of strength. That's what we're seeing in, in his progeny, great udders, balanced cows. And then we're seeing the bull transmit really well genomically as well. You know, we, you see that slide of bulls to come with alligators influence on that. That'll be alligators next influences is, is, is the way he's able to, to hit so many more markets through his sons as well um, for a short supply, high demand bull. So um, a very, very, very unique and special bull for sure. Okay, and the next question is, uh, what about pulled bulls? What do we what do we have in terms of pulled bulls or what's our initiatives on pulled bulls maybe is a good add on to that question. So yeah. that is for both the, the, the Holstein guys and, and Jersey. 
Yeah, Jay, um, I can take a stab at that one. We have uh, focused on our internal and external program. Um, it, I would say it's a weekly topic, almost daily topic that we discuss. Um, and we acquire goals that are PP or pull carrier goals in the different type of market segments that you discussed earlier, whether they're net merit or TPI or LPI. And um, last year, I believe, if I remember roughly off the top of my head, our doubles, our uh, acquisition numbers for pulled basically doubled. So you'll see more product offering in the future. Uh, again, trying to get, do that pedigree diversity and but also have those goals that rank in different rankings. So we didn't cover it today, but rest assured that we're continuing to put effort and concentration and we will. That was one of the topics that we missed out and uh, we'll make sure we probably add that to our next one in August. Jonathan, do you have? Uh, yeah, for jerseys, uh, if you uh, remember on that uh, high cheese merit uh, slide, there were three pulled bulls there. Uh, we do have a, uh, we're building our pulled lineup. We've got three homozygous pulled bulls in laser popcorn and, and kernel. And uh, that strengthening the pulled uh, lineup there. We've got uh, also have uh, multiple females that we're able to work with. <clears throat> we recently, uh, through our partnership with uh, Viera Dairy, uh, we'll be able to work with the number one pole jersey in the breed, an Eisner <clears throat> daughter that's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 179 JPI and over three and a half on DPR. So she'll not only bring uh, the strength of uh, the pole gene, but also those health traits that, that are uh, so needed. And so that is a concentration in the, in the jersey uh, lineup is pulled. Uh, we've got some up and coming. They're just not quite uh, producing semen yet, but hopefully in the next uh, few months, we'll have some real highlights to talk about. Well, that's great. And and just a comment to add on the pulled is, I mean, the market really demands a, a PP bull uh, that has all the parts and yet we maintain diversity. So we have to create PP bulls that offer diversity in genetic lines. And that's the challenge I think that you have is really develop is mixing that high genetic from the non pulled getting your pulled carriers and creating PPs that, that offer that um, the effort that's happening at CMEX towards that in the last, you know, I'm going to say, you know, three, four years has really been focusing to try to strengthen across that pulled line and have and offer some, again, maybe diversity of product line towards the different interests within the pulled group. Um, you know, it's, it's always a lot easier said than done, but I think what I see is a huge amount of progress and efforts even in buying free agents and everything toward really strengthening that pulled line. And I think it is something we'll focus on for the next uh, webinar uh, following the August proof. Um, the next question, I, and I think I'll take a stab, but I'll, uh, but I'll uh, put out the comments to any of you as well, is, is in the US for a commercial herd, would you use TPI, net merit or DWP as your main selection index. And so I'll take the first stab is, uh, is, is that, you know, and obviously a, a more commercial word probably is a little more aimed at a net merit type of index. D, DWP is, is in essence net merit with, a, with a, an, a, an emphasis put on the wellness trait from, from, from uh, Zoetis, but um, I would say that, you know, you're obviously going to have a little net merit leaning, but one of the things that we um, have developed in CMEX and will continue to develop with our next release of programs further even is, is that we really know one index fits all. And, and you really got to be, be thinking about the traits and interests you have. And, and so it's a customized net merit to me for a commercial herd that is really looking at those traits and what it's, what they're trying to achieve and what's most important and the opportunity for greatest gain and economic gain within that dairy. So I think probably a commercial herd is a little more net merit oriented, um, but, uh, but, but I think what we really have to look for is a customized net merit that fits yours. Um, there is some concern our high net merit sometimes today has low production that has traits that maybe your commercial guy doesn't quite have. The, in other words, we see a lot of low milk bulls that get up pretty high on the net merit list. And sometimes that type is, you know, having a struggle to stay above the positive line. 
And, um, and so maybe there's some, you know, there's some underlying detriment that might be of concern that might not interest totally the commercial market. So that's where I say, I think you bit, you bit fit, you, you pick through it. If it's a net merit oriented, then you're still trying to find the genetics within is what I would say, because, you know, one, one index sometimes can be not the things you're looking for. Do you have a comments? Uh, anybody else on that question? Yeah. Yeah, I'd echo your uh, comments on that. And I think we have to be respectful to any dairyman, whatever index you decide to follow, if you're su successful with it um, and you can make it profitable in your herd, and those are the type of cows that you like to milk. But I think there's enough data out there, Jay. I'd agree with you. If you want to go to net merit, then you need to do some sorts on your bulls. And you brought up the comments or some of those bulls that you know just are high on the index may not be the ones you want to use for some of the reasons that you brought up and conversely on a TPI list, if you look at that. So I think you have to not only just lock yourself into a single trait selection, but then, you know, take a little time to sort through that or have your CMEX representative sort through that to find the bulls that really fit the criteria of the type of cattle you enjoy milking or what you want to breed for the future. Okay. Um, thank you, Paul. And Another, another question we have is any red Holstein high for type that you see coming? Yeah, there's gonna be bulls coming, Jay. I think uh, probably, you know, in our group of bulls today, right now, you know, um, obviously we've got Ranger in there that's got a solid confirmation proof and we're starting to see his influence in his young stock that's just hitting the ground. If you look at the top rankings of red females and Ranger dominates, but uh, we've got a couple of bulls coming. We just brought in a red bull. Uh, by the name of Vogue Laser, that's uh, that's over three points on PTAT. That's just just arrived in a, at our isolation facilities. Uh, so we do have some bulls coming down the pipeline. I think in in the upcoming months, maybe uh, we're in a bit of a waiting period, um, but we know that there's there is that demand for it uh, of bulls to to hit that market. Uh, Paul, I don't know if if you can think of any others that are coming soon uh, that should be be coming to the market. But no, I think you. Uh... Did a great job there, Mike. I mean, yeah, the Ranger Sons are exciting. We have a lot of pregnancies throughout not only Canada and Europe, but also in the U.S. So we'll look forward to them. And obviously, they're a little ways off, but uh, we're in a, I'd say almost as an industry, at a touch of a lull for elite Red Bulls. So um, that's just not only us, but we do have some that are stepping to the plate and should be available by the, you know, winter time. I think the red's incredible that at one time the the red bulls the 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 full red bulls maybe were a bit of a sacrifice I want to say um and now and the and I look at it in the last five years particularly the growth in the you know because it used to be if you want a red you had to, and genetics you kind of maybe had to get that red carrier but I think the red bulls the 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 pure red bulls today the growth in terms of having that type and complete package hitting milk hitting the number of things, uh, you know, and some of the bulls you've named and the strength of the CMAX's lineup in that red. Uh, and, you know, and we just don't have it off the, the top, but is I think a pretty strong group of red bulls of pure, of, of total, um, not a red carrier, but a red bull is a pretty strong group. And, and you notice the strength of what's happening on the red lineup. Um, uh, one last question is for Jonathan. The, the, the dominance of bulls like Chief is how does CMEX not fall for the trap of, of becoming too one bull or to that becoming maybe too influential in your, your descendants of your next generation and, and, and that you become kind of embedded in that. Well, I guess what we're trying to say maybe there is, is um, that you don't end up with a with the situation that where we're talking about is no diversity. So how do you maintain diversity, I guess, is the question, Jonathan. So just continuing to look for those uh, lines that are different from Chief. Uh, mentioned on that one slide, ZZ Top, uh, the number five bull, he's not related to Chief. Uh, but to keep that diversity, don't we don't plan to mate him to Chief Daughters, because otherwise you're just uh, getting tied right back into that, obviously. Uh, you'd get some tremendous offspring, but you wouldn't have that diversity. So uh, that uh, pulled Eisner that I mentioned, that female uh, bringing genetics in like that, that have traits that we're looking for. But again, to, to make sure you uh, keep some lines free from chief, 
then you'll have you'll continue to have that diversity not just mating top to top but being aware of of the next two or three generations what you're going to be what you're going to have to work with that's great and critical in the jersey breed a smaller breed a number of bulls and genetics and and to keep that at, uh i think i was thinking that that if we looked at the non-chief list in the in the breed uh that it didn't have chief in it we'd dominate that group as well um the, the, and that's a little bit that example and i obviously i don't have that as a list but i think it's a pretty pretty good example of that we you know it's been almost that push of jonathan and, and people that we work with in the jersey program that are really always looking for that genetics we don't have and that's and that's that constant drive to make sure we have those in the lineup but so with that i think that's uh, all the questions i think we have and um so I'm, in closing i would like to 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 thank uh mike and paul and jonathan um for your outstanding contributions and so thank you very much I would like to also recognize and thank Joan Lau and Krista Ormason from our marketing team for their amazing support in, uh, in, in making this whole thing look great. Um, and so it turned, so as it turned out, it was not a belated April Fool's joke yesterday when we found out that uh, the US proofs were gonna be rerun and reissued. Uh, we're looking forward actually to next Tuesday because we love proof day so much we want to do it again. Um, so especially on Holstein side, I guess so. So uh, we get to, to have the information processed for males and females we will have it out to you as soon as as we can to, to, to get so you can have the decisions and the most accurate information in your hands uh, early next week for those that are US proof oriented so. So with that, uh, I would like to say thank you and to everyone uh, for your attention and, and being part and enjoy your weekend. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you everyone.